uh, that was given to him, and so pray much for him, all the upcoming trip uh, that we have with him too, okay? Anything else special tonight you want to mention before we gather around the altar? Brother Andy. Amen. Do remember Brother Leland. He has been sick this week. James has been talking with Miss Brenda some this week. Miss Nicole. Amen. Remember Dalton, her dad, Miss Keith. Mm. Amen. Do remember that. Brother Tim. Yes. That's what I understand. Somebody told me that the other day, Brother Tim. Sure did. So do pray for them. Pray for that family if you would. Miss Eva. Amen. Amen. Do you remember that, Miss Megan? Amen. Remember that tonight? Somebody else had the hand up, Brother Jeff. Isaac, you got something, buddy? Amen. Appreciate the prayers for Isaac yesterday. His surgery went well. Appreciate the prayers for that, too. I got boo-boos on it. Amen. But they're getting better, right? Amen. Miss Christian. Amen. Do remember that, Miss Sarah Ann? Chad is Robin's husband, the one we just buried on um, uh, Saturday. And Mr. Miners, let me just tell you this story. Uh, I wasn't there, uh, but uh, Jane and, and Miss Terry Lynn went down on Monday night uh, to his house. Y'all don't know him, Miss Terry Lynn's neighbors. She's been very concerned about him and been praying for him. He's an older gentleman, and I think he's battling cancer or something, right? He's battling cancer, not doing uh, well. But they went down and attacked him the other night and won him to the Lord. Amen. And I'm just thinking about that, but they, she's been concerned about him, so they went down and had a long sit spell with him and his wife uh, the other night and ended up winning him to the Lord before uh, they left. He accepted the Lord, and so thank God for that, amen. He don't, he, he looks, he look, if he dies now with cancer, guess what? He'd be healed immediately, amen. He's, he's got immediate healing coming now, so praise the Lord for that, and so do pray for me. Anybody else tonight before we pray? Miss Rosa? Amen. 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 I know she'd like to get in there, so y'all make that a matter of prayer. That'd be awesome. Amen. Anybody else before we pray tonight? Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Hallie. Go ahead, sweetie. Amen. Pray for Hallie tonight. Pray for Delaney. She's in pain. I've seen her fall about ten times last night on the skating floor. Amen. So I know she's in pain. Go ahead, Brother Chris. I mean, Miss Megan, I'm sorry. Amen. Also pray for all of them to be traveling tomorrow. There's some of them leaving that tomorrow going to the marriage conference. And uh, so I pray it helps the marriage, the home, and everything else. Amen. Uh, pray for them. Let's come gather in the altar tonight. There's a lot of things to pray about. And so I want you to come and pray about those tonight and uh, ask God's blessings on them and uh, cry out to the Lord tonight for help and for healing. Father, we love you. God, again tonight, we're most thankful tonight, God, for salvation. Uh, 
Uh, Lord, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, God, to serve you. And, Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor to be in thy house again tonight, to listen to thy word tonight, uh, God, to be with thy people tonight, to God, to be able to come to an altar and come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may be able to find help in the time of need. Thank you, Lord, for the song tonight already. God, I know that my name is there. And, Father, I stand on that in assurance today. God, I rest on the Word of God, uh, Lord, in that. There's one in the building tonight, Father, that cannot truly say that they know, that they know, that they know. Father, I know that we can go back to Scripture. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And I pray, God, if there's one here tonight that does not know that, Father, that even through Bible teaching tonight, even on finances, God, that some word would be spoken. Father, would touch that heart, draw them to you before it's eternally too late. Maybe it's in the song tonight, Lord, whatever it may be. God, we've come together, Lord, and more than anything tonight to worship you. And God, meet with brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, of like faith. And God, join in together in unity and look up to a holy God. And Lord, draw strength from you tonight. So Lord, we beg you to meet with us. God, and just in a mighty way, uh, Lord, through the singing, through the message, Lord, from Mark tonight, through the teaching. God, through prayer tonight around the altar, bless our young people. As Brother Jeff's already said, pray for our youth. God, we cry out to you tonight, God, that they would cry out to you. And Father, I beg you, God, to reach down where they are and meet them where they are. And God, just show them the right path. And Lord, just help lead them on the right path. And God, help them not to be led astray in this world, in this life. Father, help me to be a better pastor and a better preacher to them. And God, a better servant and a better leader to them. And help me to make a bold stand in the gospel, Father. We may preach what thus saith the Lord. And may it be glorified in a mighty way. Father, use us here at the church that you'd be magnified and glorified through all that we do. And Lord, we're going to thank you and love you. God, for what you've done for us already this week, what you will do tonight, what you will do tomorrow, we praise you for it already. We ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank the Lord. I'm going to give you just a few announcements tonight. And uh, then I think Blake and them are going to sing. One of Mark's going to come teach for us. Uh, but do remember that there's some there's things been mentioned about the junior camp. If you have some juniors here that are interested in going to camp, be sure that you see Tabitha about that. We are still praying about some van drivers for Sunday morning. I've got one gentleman uh, that's called me and said he will be on that list uh, if he can get a partner to ride with him uh, and help him. <clears throat> I've got one already, and but we are still looking for at least we want at least two couples is what we want. Uh, or, you know, two men, two women, or husband-wife team, or whatever, a good team to go out uh, and drive the van. And so pray and ask God about it first. Don't just come and tell me. Pray and ask God, uh, because there, there's a sacrifice there, and sacrifices don't come easy. And so pray about that, if you would. Uh, and then also, uh, don't forget our stew coming up on April the 13th. Remember the sale for that. Uh, and uh, next week, we're going to be attending a couple of revival meetings, one uh, on the 12th, which is Tuesday night, uh, Brother Thackers and then Steve and them toward the weekend, maybe Friday night. And so pray much for them. Also, we've got the Triangle Awakening papers in the back so that you'll know how to pray uh, for people and how to bring a friend and how to encourage people uh, to come to the Triangle Awakening. Once we pick these trailers up on Saturday with all the stuff, we're picking up a lot of flyers and, and thousands of Be My Guest cards uh, that we'll be picking up on Saturday and bringing back. And so from here on out, once we get these Be My Guest cards, we'll be canvassing the whole uh, county around here and putting them indoors everywhere, uh, all over the place, and inviting people to come. And so we need your help with that, too. Put them out at your workplace. Put them out. Listen, I, and let me just tell you, you're going to run across people who says, I don't care for that, and I don't want anything to do with that. Don't let that bother you. We see that a lot. We see it more than ever now. You just give the next person one. Amen? And listen, the Bible, J Jesus' word, Jesus teaches us, not to cast a pearl among swine, amen. If they don't want it, they ain't got to have it, amen. But it's up to us to offer it, okay? And so offer it out there uh, if you would, okay? Any other announcement? Go ahead, Mama. Yes, 
That's right, and that's for the junior class uh, on Sunday morning. And so we're still praying about another lady to help. We've got one lady that has volunteered for that, and we still need another lady to help out in that class, help take that class over uh, so they can work together. There's a lot of people been in a lot of positions for a long time, amen? And if they could get a break for a little while, uh, would help them out tremendously. You never know, next year they may go right back into it. Uh, but some of you upcoming young ladies pray about, pray hard about God using you somewhere and you're working in a Sunday school class and, and doing some things for the Lord. Amen to that. Besides just coming to church looking pretty. A- amen. Give them, get, give them guys something to look for. They, they can tell you work. Say amen right there. Amen. Boy, y'all ain't in it tonight. Amen. That's all right. But uh, I'm just trying to help you. Amen. Trying to help the church too. Anything else tonight? All right, none else tonight. I, Mike, I believe you and Tabby are going to sing one for us tonight. I think they're going to sing one for us tonight. And uh, then after that, we're going let, to let the juniors and all of them be dismissed. And Mark's going to come teach for us tonight. Sure is good to be back. Amen. Man, I'll tell you what. Ain't nothing like coming back and sitting behind this old piano and playing. Don't nothing beat it in the world. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast told me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Yeah. 
with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. something it, it may not be well at the house and it may not be well in the marriage and it may not be well with the kids it may not be well at the workplace but you better know that it's well with your soul because we're not promised tomorrow we don't know that we're going to wake up in the morning and we don't know that we're going to make it home tonight uh, but God does know amen and you better make sure that it's well three weeks from tonight brother Mike three weeks from tonight we're going to be in Israel amen it's almost here, Jane and I, Brother Mike, Miss Joan, and uh, like I said, we leave on Tuesday, and uh, March the 26th, I know Tab is tough, sweetie, I'm, I'm going to have to get you a ticket, ain't I, amen, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to tell y'all what, I got problems around my house, let me tell y'all this before Mark starts, I got problems around my house, when other men start bringing my, my wife flowers during the day when I'm hard at work, I got issues. Something's got to change. Amen. And I know who it is because I, I caught them picking the flowers. I saw them. Amen. Then they showed up at my house. Amen. Better bring some money. Amen. I, yes, I appreciate that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Jane. He called me and left me a message yesterday, last night. Said to, said to call him. We'll come by. And we left the skating ring. I told Jane, I said, we've got to call Yance and see if he's still up. Of course, me and Jane got talking and forgot about it. So I walked in the house this afternoon. I said, hey, did you think about calling Yance today? Because I thought about it about 2 o'clock this afternoon. She said, oh, oh yeah, she said, I got something to show you. And I went in there. There's a big old thing of buttercups in there he had bought down out of there. That, that was all right. Amen. She said, you get him tonight. Amen. I appreciate that. Have you all enjoyed Mark's teaching? I tell you, I, I, I really hate to see it in. I really do. I've learned a lot from him. And I appreciate his dedication, all his hard work. I don't know how he's going to finish up tonight, uh, what he's going to do. Uh, but he said he's prepared. Amen. But I appreciate all these done. Mark, come on, teach to us tonight, brother. I'm, I'm really looking forward to next Wednesday night myself <laughs> and having the preacher back in the pulpit and, uh, and learning things. But I tell you, this is a church that is it's amazing. And one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is abundance because we're going to talk about saving and growing, but abundance. This church, is there's abundance here. There's abundance of the right stuff. And it's not that it's overflowing at the edges and things, but it's, it's here. It's what we need. And, and it's simple things. Think of, we're a church with two pianos. We've had two wonderful piano players that step up to the plate every time we need music. And, it, you know, it's just it's amazing. And, and when there's a need, you talk about the work days. You talk about putting up the tents. You talk about providing for the missionaries that come in here and things. And it's not like we're sitting around and thinking there's a pot of gold somewhere or there's a big fat checkbook somewhere that's going to take care of all these things. But what we have is adequate. And it takes care of it. And it's such a wonderful place. I mean, look around. This, you, no one's sitting on plain wood pews. If they were, it would still be okay. We could have church. But we have a place where we have heat. We have lights. We have air conditioning. We've got a good, safe place to come to and worship. And like I said, it's not because there's a big checkbook tied to it or a big bank account tied to it. It's because, it's because of the people of this church going to God in prayer hey. and seeking his guidance before they even start figuring out the money and Amen. the the planning and all that goes into it. It's God provided adequately. He provided adequately for this church, and he can provide adequately, too, for our homes. But um, before I get started, <laughs> let's, say a, let's say a prayer. Dear Father, Lord, I just thank you for this evening. I thank you for this day and the opportunity, Lord, to come into a place and freely worship you, Lord, to freely share your word, to, to, to study your word, to seek your guidance, Lord. I just I thank you for each and every family that's here, Lord. I pray that 
the things we share tonight and every time we gather as a church, Lord, there is something, there's a spoonful, there's a, there's, a, there's a bucket full, there's something that we can take back, Lord, to have a closer walk with you and a better understanding of the word, a better understanding of you, and a better understanding of the abundance that you can supply and that you provide and how you can take care of us in all situations, Lord. We may not see it, we may not see it at the moment, but through your provision, and through trusting in you, Lord, we see what can happen. And for this, we're very thankful. Lord, we pray for this church. We pray for the, each and every family represented here, Lord. For it's in your son's precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And all. But yeah, this is, this is the final night. So like I said, Preacher Mike will be back next week. And, uh, and we'll get started with some, uh, some preaching and things. But I'm, I'm hopeful and prayerful that over the last several weeks, some of the things, and I know you see some of the same slides every week, but this is developing attitudes and good habits Amen. and a good understanding. What I referred to, and I think I mentioned to you before, habitudes. Habitudes is something that I, I talk to some of the men about at the mission all the time. And their faith can grow, their faith can grow strong, and their trust in the Lord can grow strong. We also need to develop some good habits and attitudes along the way. And as you grow closer to Christ, your habits and your attitudes are going to be better. Right. They're going to be better. You're going to be striving for better habits and attitudes, whether that's in your work, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your home, or whether it's in your, in your pocketbook. And that's, that's what we're talking about now. And we've, we've come to realize, and I know these things are repetitive, but sometimes we need repetitiveness to remember and reflect on. Reflect on every time we whip out that checkbook or that debit card or that credit card, or we think about how we're going to make that purchase or how we're going to spend our paycheck or use our paycheck and as we've discussed we know that God owns it all it's all his the abilities that we have the abilities we have to earn and I love teaching about vocation I like teaching about work and the Bible has a lot of things has a lot of information in there about work and it was interesting I was listening to and I know I mentioned Jeff Foxworthy and Danzel Washington and all before and I love when I see these strong Christian men sharing who are on a stage and they're in a place where they can share the gospel, and maybe there's folks that will listen to them that won't listen to us wow. just because of the position they have. But um, one of the things that Foxworthy was talking about the other day, he talked about how Jesus, Jesus, you know, he went to the, he, he uh, said, you know, he has all the redneck jokes. And he said Jesus loved the redneck. He loved the redneck. He went and he hired the fishermen. He hired the people from the, from the pier. He hired the people who were the laborers and the workers <laughs> and all. But it's just, you know, it's, it's the principles and the things that the Bible tells us is for everybody. Amen. It doesn't matter what walk of life we come from, what the size of our checkbook is, or what our hardship is. The Bible is written for all of us. And it's like the preacher, it's like uh, Preacher Vaughn said the other day, that's the, that's the success book. <laughs> right. You know, if we're following what the Bible says, that's how we measure success. Success isn't that what's in the driveway or the size of the house we're living in. But all these things can develop the right management, the right principles when you're looking at your money and using your money. We talk about the financial pie, and I know you're getting tired of financial pie, but it's what we're talking about, and it's what we're dealing with. And this financial pie is the, the treasures that God has provided to you. Everybody, as we said in the past, some people have big pies, some people have small pies. Some people have pies that are still green, but they have their pie. And there's, we've talked about the five things you can do. We've talked about the living slice. And everybody, living's the easiest slice out there. We all know how to live, and we all know how to live large if we want to, if we choose that, if we go down that path. Living large is easy. The world comes at us and tells us every minute of the day how to spend our money and how when we spend our money or spend our treasure and what we have, it's going to make us better. And if you have to, go and borrow some money or we'll give you, we'll, we'll give you credit for the next five years so you can live large for the next five years. Right. And we've talked about that trap. We've talked about that trap. There are times to use debt. There is time to borrow. But it's not as frequently as we may think it needs to be done. And it's coming at you all the time. But tonight we're going to talk about the grow slice, the grow pie. You know, when we're growing and saving, when we're growing and saving, and I'm going to talk about saving, I'm going to talk about growing, which is, can be looked at as two different things or two different stages. When you're doing that and you're doing that correctly, 
and the slice of pie, the changes in there. And like I said, when, when, you, when you decide to give more or you go further in debt and you owe more, it's going to take from another part of your pie. Wow. It might take the nice slice off. It might take the crust off. It might take your favorite part of that pie off. But it's going to change it. It's going to reduce it when you increase somewhere else. But when you are growing, when you're able to grow and grow your treasures in the right way, and I'm not talking about hoarding, I'm talking about growing for the right things, then that give slice should be able to increase. And that live slice is going to reduce some. And you also should be able to reduce the debt side too when you start (laughs) thinking about growing because every time there's a major need or every time you need to fix the water heater or put that new roof on, there's some money that's been set aside or some forethought that's gone into it to prepare you for that situation. But the growth slice is what we're going to talk about tonight. And you know, to grow, I think about the savings and our savings, and, and the savings is like the seed. The seed is that money we get when we take in money. Let's talk about a paycheck. Um, if you take in a paycheck and you take some of that, obviously we've talked about giving, we've talked about tithing, we've talked about free will giving, we've talked about tax sacrificial giving, when you've met those needs and you would address your debt, you need to set some aside. You need to plant those seeds. You need to plant that money, that treasure in the right place. And when you plant it in the right place, it's going to grow. And we're going to talk about that growing part. It's like, it's like a harvest. When you plant those seeds, I'm not talking about big money. I'm talking about taking some from your paycheck, making it a habitude and setting it aside. After you take care and you go through prayer and you think about what you have to give and what you have to give out at that moment for kingdom building, it doesn't mean that what you're saving isn't going to go for kingdom building later on. And it should. It very well should. But you have to nourish that. It's like growing. You've got to put it in good soil. We're going to talk about that. There's different types of investments and different type of containers to put money into. And you've got to make sure you put it in the right soil to get it to grow in the right way. And we'll discuss that here in a few moments. The way we think about money, the way we think about money and where money is in our heart is going to show us what our harvest is like. This isn't preaching prosperity, but it's talking about putting money in the right places, to have your pie in the right shape, to bring the peace and contentment that you can deal with things as they happen as they happen. And it's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. It's a, it's a transformation. We're going to talk about that. And the one thing, too, when we talk about how we think about money, a lot of times, it's, and I've seen this with clients, I've seen it with folks, it's how our family thinks about money. You know, how the mom and dad thinks about the money or how the grandmother thinks about the money is a lot of times how the children live. And a lot of these issues become generational. I'm not just, that's not saying that somebody that has a lot of wealth or a lot of money and their kid gets it, they're going to take care of it the same way their mom and dad did. A lot of times that doesn't happen. And I can tell you all kinds of stories about that when it's just that huge windfall. It came from mommy and daddy. And I'm not downplaying that at all. That's a wonderful thing. We, the Bible talks about inheritance. It talks about passing things along. But it needs to go into the right situation. We need to train our kids. We need to teach our kids. We need to share things with our kids. And, and I go back to, the, to when, you were, when you were talking about your son and his birthday money that he got. He wanted to give it all. I bet he didn't learn to give it all by what he was watching on TV or what he saw in the, car, in the cartoons. He probably learned to give it all by the folks that surrounded him, by being in church and being with people that knew about growing God's kingdom. And what the real value of money is not. It's not what the world is saying it is. Yes, it's it's real currency. It's something we can use to pay our bills, but it's not to be worshipped. It's not the answer to all things. You know, there's so many people that say, oh, if I only had that money. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But it is a generational thing. It can become a generational thing, and I've seen it so often. I've seen moms and dads that were savers, took care of their bills, were responsible, they were doing the right things, and I've seen that passed along to their children. It doesn't always happen, but more often than not, it does happen. What you learn in your home, what your child is exposed to in your home, 
is what happens out there in the world when they leave home. And I will say there's exceptions to it. I never saw my dad steal anything. I never saw my dad go to jail. I never saw him go to prison. I never saw him fail in the way that I did. He wasn't a perfect man, but he took care of his family. He took care of his family. I was raised, there was nothing that my mom and dad could have done differently. And a lot of times a parent who has a child in prison or incarcerated or has some struggle or has an addiction says, what could we have done differently? What could we have done differently? It's my fault. What could we have done differently? And it's a lot of times nothing that they did. It's that child, that, that, that person's bad decisions and bad mistakes, things that they should. They, heck, I tell people all the time, I waited until I was 50 to get in trouble. I should have known better. And yes, I did know better. I knew better. I knew better. And if I had a, I've sat there and thought about my dad sitting there watching me, and my Heavenly Father was watching all the time, he knew exactly what Mark was doing. But Charlie Hall didn't know what Mark was doing. But if I had thought a little bit more about that, maybe I wouldn't have even crossed the line. I don't know. But it is generational. It, it can be generational. We need to teach our kids. We need to obviously tell them what the Word says about money, about treasure, about life, about all things. And, all, and we always, you know, all of us have had a, a mother or a father or a grandfather that has that cliche. What's that cliche when it comes to saving you need to save for a rainy day. Rainy days look differently in all kinds of things. A rainy day can be a real rainy day. It could be showers from above. But it can also be a rainy day can be when my transmission goes out or when my son or daughter calls from school or when I had a doctor's bill or I got to take care of that, that dentist bill that insurance doesn't quite cover or you got to pay that deductible. All those life things, we do need to save for those rainy days. And even, you know, I thought the squirrel was kind of interesting, that even all God's creatures know we need to save and store up. You know, sometimes they talk about the, the squirrel putting, the, putting the, the walnuts and chestnuts and things away to save for that, that winter day. But we all need to put things aside and talk about what the Bible says about it. Let's talk about what the Bible says. If we look at Proverbs 21, 20, I'm going to read this scripture. I've got to take my glasses off to read. Um, look at Proverbs. And Proverbs, Proverbs, and this sounds like a crazy thing, but yeah, Proverbs is full of good stuff. But the Bible's full of good stuff. But Proverbs is, it, it's, it's our instruction manual for success. But it says, There is treasure to be desired, and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish men spendeth it up. I read the scripture, but then I go down and read the, the notes in here, the study part, and it's just plain and simple. It's plain and simple. I try to think, okay, how can I paraphrase this? But the easiest way is just to read this. This proverb, proverb is about saving for the future. Easy credit has many people living on the edge of bankruptcy. The desire to keep up appearance and accumulate more drives them to spend every penny they earn and then stretch your credit to the limit. That happens so often. If our pie is only a certain size, you know, we're wanting our pie and we're wanting our neighbor's pie as dessert, too. Or we're going to go borrow the neighbor's pie so we have enough pie to eat. It's going beyond. It's going beyond. It's stretching us to the limits. Let's see. And they stretch their credit to the limit, but anyone who spends all he has is spending more than he can afford. That's true. It's like one of the principles. Don't spend more than you make. Live within your means. A wise man puts money aside for when he may have less, when he may have less. God approves of foresight and restraint. God's people need to examine their lifestyle to see whether their spending is God-pleasing or merely self-pleasing. Is it pleasing God or is it pleasing ourselves? Is it something we're trying to do just to please ourselves, just to polish up our image, just to make our driveway look nice, just to make our house a little bigger. You know, we talked about borrowing last week. Borrowing is not bad. It's not a bad thing. It's not a sin. The Bible doesn't talk to us about borrowing being a sin. The Bible gives us caution, gives us those side effects of borrowing money. And when we look at a house, it's not the house that gets us in trouble. It might be where the house is. It might be the size of the house. It might be the 
amenities of the house, are we living within our means? Are we living within our means? But in Proverbs, they talk about storing up oil, store, talk about storing up food, setting it aside for another day. How do we balance saving money and not storing up treasures on earth? You know, the Bible talks, you know, we have, the, we have in, the, in the first night, I think we talked about the wise man. He wasn't, he was hoarding. He was wanting his things. He was wanting to keep his things. He wasn't willing to give those up to follow Christ. When we talk about what we have, we've got to measure and see, are we willing to give those up? You know, it's, a, it's interesting. The TV show, what is it called? Pickers. Any of y'all seen Pickers? And they go out and they look at neat stuff. And it's pretty amazing the kind of junk they go and find, the stuff they find. And they'll find something, and they'll see it, and you'll see something. And it's like, man, I remember when I had plenty of those when I was a kid. I used to play with them and tear them up when I was a kid, and now they're in there being sought after and being collected and being saved. There's nothing wrong with that. But when that becomes our controlling factor, and I can think back now to clients that I had. You know, I, I shared about the client who was a, was a large Wachovia shareholder. She had more than she ever needed. But she was a of herself. She never enjoyed the pleasure of, of giving something. She never really enjoyed the pleasure of the treasures that she had. It, she became a, obsessed with what's my bank account. And it wasn't out of a need. It was more out of where her values were, what she had. And I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. It, yes, it, it had some greed in it, but it was probably just she never came to know the Lord. She never learned how to love somebody, how to give something. She was a lonely lady and all. But, you know, when we talk about this, too, and I think back about clients and situation, there's a, there's a generation in America which is dying out, and that's the folks that survived and lived through the Depression. That's a little different situation. They lived through things that sometimes we can't imagine. And so that became their lifestyle, to hoard, to hoard, to hoard. Saving and growing is setting aside for our needs or needs, realistic needs that we see might need to be met. Things that we might see coming down the pike that we need to take care of, realistic things. We could all, we could all plan our life for a, nuclear disaster this Sunday and decide we're going to stay home and stay in our basement or a fallout shelter if you have something like that. But we're not planning our lives around something like that happening. We're going to get up, get in the car, and come to church. It's not going to be a controlling factor. When it becomes a controlling factor, that's when it becomes a problem. Let's look back at Scripture again, too. Let's look at Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. I like this. We get to talk about insects. As a little kid, wouldn't you like that? It says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, oversee her ruler, provided her meat in the summer, and gather her food in the harvest. You know, that's, that's a, I, there's a couple ways of looking at that. You know, it's, it's, it's telling us that the ant is setting things aside. It is providing for the next season to be able to have food to get through the next season. But one thing that really hits me, and also when I looked at this picture, and I went and I, I Googled and looked up things on ants. Ants are incredible creatures. And uh, we don't like them in our house at all. We don't like them on our food. But when you think about God's amazement, these little ants are pretty amazing. You ever seen what they can carry? You ever seen these ant mounds they build? And you hear about these and you read about them, and you know they don't have hearing but it's by vibrations that they can figure their way around and all. But think about the diligence of that ant. Think about the diligence. The diligence of an ant, if you think about it, they may be carrying those leaves and they may be carrying that food. And if you're looking at an ant hill and you're looking at food there, there's not lines just going one way. There's lines coming and going and coming and going and coming and going and they're diligent. And they're carrying little pieces, yes. Some of these little pieces are bigger than they are, but they're constant at it. They made it part of their habit, part of their habit and attitude. And when I think about saving and nurturing and growing, that's the way we should be. 
Yes, there's situations, there's times when what we used to refer to as a, as a new Hank Aaron account or a Babe Ruth account, that's somebody who hits a home run, has a huge windfall, and they walk in the door and we're all over them because we won't be able to have their accounts with us. But when I look at clients that I had and people that I look at, it's the ones that stuck to their job, did their career well. You might not think that they would have accumulated what they did, but it was that diligence. It was the diligence of the ant. It was showing up at work every day. It was constantly saving some money. Not big amounts, but some. Some of the biggest wealth, or if you're looking at just numbers that I've seen, are from people that didn't have the huge mega job. They were just consistent with it, and they were saving. They were saving. They were setting money aside. And there's lots of ways, and we'll talk about it. You know, one, one way, I, I, when I think about the ants, the thing I envision is the, is the client that, um, or the individual that has the opportunity, and I haven't gotten in too much to mechanics of, of the finance world, but, you know, the, the person has the opportunity to save some money at work through a 401k. Do a savings plan at work. A savings plan at work. Think about that. There is no better medicine out there. I used to get people all the time, and I didn't like this question. I'd be at the, the cafe or on the street or something somewhere, and someone would say, well, tell me what I can do with this money, or tell me what I should do with this money, or what would you do if you had? I didn't like to deal with that. I didn't like it. I would tell them to set up an appointment and come see me. Yes, because that's what I was doing, but every situation is different. <clears throat> but one thing that's pretty consistent across the board, and I would always talk to people when they were thinking about saving or starting to invest, is the first thing you need to look at is where you're working at. See if there's something available there. We get our paycheck. We're looking for that paycheck. It comes automatically. It might be weekly or biweekly or it might be once a month. But we see that paycheck. If we're working somewhere where they offer that, there's no reason in the world not to participate in it. <coughs> Some of you might say, well, I just can't afford it. I can't afford it. But if you set it aside, and I've seen people start with just very little. I've seen small, just like these ants, I've seen small amounts. And if we can convince somebody to start saving that way, and particularly if you have an employer that matches some of it, <coughs> but if that's systematic, it's a habit. It's a habit and an attitude that they're constantly setting something aside. Number one, they're going to feel better about themselves. They're going to feel better about the shape of their pie. They're going to see their pie coming together. But also, and it's inevitable, it happens. Even at the mission, when I talk to people about money, and they might be talking about a $30 a week stipend or a $50 a week stipend, <coughs> and I can talk with them about just, if they end up with $3 left from last week or $5 left from last week and some from the prior week, that's making progress. And I've seen guys save. I've seen guys save. And I get excited now when somebody comes up and says, Mr. Hall, I still got $10 left from last week, and I got $5 left from the week before. I get very excited about that because that's progress. But going back to the, the, con the, the constant, the systematic investing, 401k is, a, is by far the easiest way to start. And I see people come into the office who didn't want to do this. It was the thing I can't do because they can't afford it. But they start. It might be just a little bit every week. But six months down the line or a year down the line, they come in and they have a statement and say, I've never had this amount of money saved up. It might be $400, it might be $500, it might be $1,000, but they're seeing that it can be done. It's just like our salvation. When we've experienced it ourselves, we know it works. When somebody sees that, they see that it does work. They see that they can, that this is, this is something that's available to them. So we need to be like the ants. We need to be diligent. We need to be diligent. This is something, too, that we can teach our children. <coughs> we need to teach our children about setting some aside, taking time to set it aside. You know, there's all, there's, there's all types of things here that we can talk about. You know, we can talk about checking, we can talk about saving, and we can talk about investing. And investing is not buying a lottery ticket. You don't invest in a lottery ticket. You blow money on a lottery ticket. And, you know, I used to think, man, North Carolina, I'll get the lottery because everybody's crossing the state line. But I'm not for that. I'm not for that. Just to wait in the line to get a lottery ticket. But it's amazing. I see, I rode to work today with an officer 
and another guy on work release. We went to work, and on 147, it has a big sign. It says, Jackpot, 300 and some million. And I know this happens, but they get excited and say, boy, that would take care of all my problems. That would take care of all my problems. It wouldn't take care of all their problems. Right. Number one, it can also create a lot of problems. Amen. And this is, this is some that I'm sure there's folks and maybe even here saying, well, these are problems I could deal with. But even how to handle that, how to take care of it, how to park it, how to place it in the right places. <coughs> but it's not, a, it's not buying a lottery ticket. Checking in savings is money that what I would refer to as front burner money, go-to money. Those are things that you need for your immediate needs, the things you need to pay your, your monthly bills with, the things you need to make your car payment with, the things you need, it's where you need to pull from, it's how you move money to the offering plate. That's a mechanic, that's a tool that you need. When we talk about investing, there's all types of things. And, and we'll go to, just to, to look at what the Bible has to say about investing, you know, we go to Proverbs, Proverbs 31. That's something that a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people can, can ring it off the top of their head. Talks about a lady. When you think about this lady here, she was a genius. She was a very smart lady. She was a Bible genius. She was following what God says to do. She was running that household or operating that household with her family, with her husband, the right way. So if you read it, she was quite the entrepreneur. She was quite the entrepreneur. But we look in here, we look at verse 16. It says, She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planted a vineyard. She wasn't making investments to hoard and to buy more land. She wasn't just buying up land to say I have a thousand acres or two thousand acres. She was looking at that and seeing what it could produce. What it could produce. It wasn't about collecting the land. It was about using a resource that God provided to grow. To grow. She was investing. And when we look at investing investments and all, and they come at you all the time, all the time. You know, we look at stocks, we look at bonds, we look at mutual funds. And they can all be very, very confusing. And I'm not going to say they're wrong. I think the, the financial markets and, and equities and stocks and things are, are valuable tools. They're valuable tools to our country. There are some that aren't doing the right thing. Some of our structure, and we could get into this about how, how debt has taken over corporate America, but it's certainly taken over our country. But there are good investments out there. But we've got to, you've got to look at them. And the thing about good investments, it's not always on the performance. It's not always on the return of those. We've got to think, and, if you, if, and a lot of people say, well, I never do invest. But if you're working somewhere and you have a 401k, that money's invested. Your towns, your municipalities, they take money and invest it. Your bank has taken money and invested. Yes, there's FDIC insurance to step in if all else fails. And that's not true. That's true. They will step in. But there's a higher power than even that and all. But we've got to look at also when you're working with investments, when you're planting money, you need to know what it's planted in. Just like this lady knew she was planting a vineyard. She knew what she was going to do with the grapes. There's a lot of places out there as, as a Christian we don't want to have our money. We don't want to have our money in certain things. I can think back 15, 16 years ago, one of our clients was the North Carolina Baptist Foundation. And I used to not have any patience because there was nothing that they would buy. They wouldn't invest in the investments that I thought were great investments. But I have a con had a conversation with a man named Edward Coates. He was the executive director of the North Carolina Foundation. He was a wonderful Christian. And uh, he shared with me, and he made it plain and simple. Why would he want to take the foundation's money, or even his own personal money, and put it into companies and things that might promote things that don't follow the Christian belief, such as gambling, such as some of the movies and things that's out there? There's a lot of things. And it's even like, buy, like supporting the lottery. And this isn't a soapbox, but why would we want to put money, first off, that's a losing proposition, but why would we want to put our money into a company or into a state organization 
that has done so much damage. Think about the families. Think about your daughter or your daughter's husband or your son-in-law or somebody in your family whose life has been destroyed because of a gambling addiction or an alcohol addiction or a pornography addiction. All these things are supported by investing, by investors sometimes. And that's not a negative against investing. It's just that we need to be cautious. You need to know where you're putting your money. You need to know what kind of soil you're planting your money into. I used to go and see clients, and it always amazed me. This was also before a lot of electronic delivery of statements and things. But I'd walk in, and they'd have a stack three or four inches high of statements that they never opened. As a steward, steward of God's resources, we need to be aware. We need to be opening those things. Who do you think became my victims? Some of those folks that didn't open their statements. They trusted me, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that trust. Trust is a wonderful thing to be able to have. But you need to participate in it. God showered you with these resources and provide these resources. You need to take part in it because you're looking after them for kingdom purposes. I've gotten off track a little bit there, but we're, we're sharing. But the Bible does talk about investing. Basically taking the resources and using them for the right things and to grow God's kingdom. As we start thinking about concluding this, concluding tonight in these six weeks, there's a couple things we need to ask. You need to look at your own personal situation. Your own personal situation may, may be $15 to your name. It may be nothing to your name tonight. It may be six and seven figures to your name. That's not the issue, but we need to think about where we're at now, where we think we need to be to fully serve God. Are we giving enough? Are we too far in debt? Do we need to, do we need to reach into our checkbook and pay off some debt? But we were, buying, we were having comfort because of our checking account balance. We need to address those things. Where do we want to be? What do we want our pie to look like? Do, are we stretched to the limits that our live slice is so big and our debt slice is so big? Is that the way we want to continue on? Is that the way we want our kids to learn? Is that the way we want to be going forward? These things don't happen overnight. You didn't get in that situation overnight. And if you're in a perfect situation, you have a wonderful pie, I think that's great. That didn't happen overnight. Even if you had a windfall and it all dropped on you at one day and you had this huge windfall, you had to sit down and figure out how you're going to take care of that pie in the right situations to put it in. But there's different stages, and I broke this down in four different stages. You know, the first stage is probably where a lot of us have been or maybe are as a young person or someone starting out, and that's struggling. If we're struggling, we need to look at where we're spending our money, and we need to start reducing some of this debt that we have. You know, there's simple things out there and, and, and procedures to follow. Dave Ramsey talks a lot about it. Now, I'm kind of a, a lukewarm Dave Ramsey guy. I like him, but I'm not thrilled by him. Um, but you start looking at your smallest debt. Start addressing that and paying that off. When you pay that off, attack debt number two and work your way. And it will happen. It's just like that 401k saver or that person who's setting some money aside systematically every single pay period. One of these days they'll get their statement and they'll look at it and say, wow, this is progress. This is progress. I am getting out of debt. The next one is surviving. When you're surviving, that's when you're creating that emergency fund. You're setting some money aside for when those things happen. You're setting some money aside so you don't have to go in debt and you can use that money for those unexpected things that come up. But you should have some money set aside. That's surviving. And then we get to a stable situation. We hope and pray that we get to a stable, a stable situation. That's when we're able to save for some of those longer-term things. We need to save for retirement. We need to set it aside. And re the Bible... What does it say? It, it says very little about retirement. It talks more about working and being productive throughout your lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying retiring as far as checking out from getting a paycheck. I'm talking about retiring from doing nothing. We say, I guess, Yancey, he blew the whistle on you. You were the one that took flowers to a neighbor, right? That's not retiring. That's serving. That's helping, and that's serving your neighbor. It doesn't mean sitting on the recliner all day long and doing nothing. God built us to do something. He built us to share our lives. 
And then we move on to secure. And when you're in a secure position, that's when you can start looking at other things. You can start looking at even giving money away in bigger ways. I'm not saying you're not giving all along. You should be giving all along. You should be giving even in that struggling position. Even when you're in that struggling position, you need to be meeting your tithe. You need to be thinking about some free will giving. These are things, there's no perfect answer. There's no perfect answer. I used to have clients say, well, how much should I keep in my checking account? I couldn't answer that question for them. I used to say, before I knew the Lord and knew how to speak on them from a biblical standpoint, I said, you need to keep in that checking account what makes you feel comfortable. Some people were comfortable with just a couple hundred dollars in there. Some people were comfortable when it, it was just above zero. But there were some that wanted six figures in there. They could buy the grocery store, but they were afraid they were going to run out of groceries. But it's what makes you feel comfortable and what you, dis, what you reflect on when you go to prayer and you ask God for the guidance. So the thing I would ask is, in closing, as we've talked about pie, how do you want your pie to look? How do you want your pie to shape up? How do you want to make your pie? Now, you know, I, I like videos and I like using stories. I've got a short five-minute video. And I hope I'm doing okay on time, Pastor. It's four past. But I've got a short five-minute video, which I think is an incredible story of a young man. I say young. He's younger than me, much younger than me, which a lot more people are nowadays than ever before. But um, I don't want to say too much about his story, but he had all the money. Well, it's an exaggeration, but he had pretty much all the money in the world thrown at him, given to him. He had the largest NFL contract for a center in the NFL. And things changed. He started receiving all that big money. And all of a sudden, and this is about planning for tomorrow, all of a sudden, one team benched him. But that wasn't the end of the story. He was offered other contracts. He, and he'll talk about the story. He was offered another contract. And it was big numbers. It would have still kept him the highest played center in the NFL. But he felt God's calling. He felt God's calling. He felt a different calling in his life. He was willing to give all that up. His agent argued and argued and said, this is the biggest mistake in the world you made. But he walked away from that. It's just like that rich man who didn't walk away from it. And yes, this former player, is, he's well taken care of now but not to the balances in his checkbook that he would have been. But he gave it up for God. And I want to show this, this short video. It's just, I thought it was very inspirational. There's so many components of what we've talked about in the last couple of weeks that I see in this video. Thank you. 
There's so so many so many lessons in that video, and uh, those lessons are what we've talked about. We've talked about giving. We've talked about using our talents. We've talked about getting away from the, what the world thinks. We've talked about living within our means, living within what God intends us to do, and how He wants us to use His treasure. And this Jason Brown, I've spoken to him a couple of times here recently and um, it's an amazing story his wife was a dentist and they gave all that up this is their ministry you know what the name of his farm is it goes along with our lessons the name of his farm is first fruit farms in nash county that's a man whose life has been changed yes i'm sure he's able to pay his power bill and pay his bills but he gave up a lot to serve Christ, to give, to do what God wanted us and intended us to do with the treasures that he gives to us. And yes, he, Jason Brown is not a perfect guy, but we can do the same things. And it doesn't mean having to give away 100,000 pounds of food. It may be giving away those flowers. It may be giving up some time. It may be just in helping. But I just, you know, I, there, there's two quick things that, that I... I think about, you know, and if one of my, I wrote some notes, say if we're taking a long-term perspective, an eternal perspective, if we're taking an eternal perspective to things, when we make decisions today, they're probably a better decision for our future, obviously for eternity. 
And then financial maturity is being able to give up today's desires for the growth of God's kingdom for the long-term perspective. But um, I want to thank you all, and it's, it's, it's been a privilege to be here and teach, and I appreciate Mike letting me do that. And isn't it, a, isn't it a, how many people, <laughs> how many took, people took a money lesson from an embezzler? Raise your hand if you've done that before. <laughs> Wait till that makes the newspaper. <laughs> You know, how many, how many people have taken a money class from somebody whose picture was in the post office? <laughs> it was never in the post office. But um, it's just how God works. It's just how God works. And, you know, we can, we, I, I could sit here and slice and dice the financial markets and financial instruments and how you should do this and how you should do that. But none of that matters a lick until you get the right perspective and we realize that it all belongs to God. He gives us the ability, and we need to be good stewards of it and use it to serve him. And he does tell us to take care of our family. He does tell us to be responsible. So it's all about putting it in the right perspective. But thank you all. And we get preacher back next week. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. I have enjoyed that. And uh, I appreciate Mark, and I appreciate all his hard work and effort that he put into all of that. And uh, he said just several things that struck me uh, along the way, talking about saving that little bit here and there, there was a there was a friend of mine told me this recently. Uh, there was an, an elderly lady, and uh, she was uh, going through a tough time. She was uh, in and out of the hospital a little bit. She had been a school teacher uh, in her lifetime, and uh, she was in and out of the hospital. and And the, the pastor had gone over to see. And this is a true story. It happened right here in Roxborough, and the pastor had gone over to a house to see her. And uh, going to get together and with the church and, and have a little canvassing for her and, and carry her some food and help her out. And she said, no, Pastor, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Everything's fine. Just take care of the church. It, 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 I'm fine. He said, no, we want to try to help you out. And she said, no, Pastor, I'm, I'm fine. Well, the long and short is the pastor tried, and, and she kept saying, no, Pastor, I'm, I'm fine. Never asked for anything. And she said, since you live in a little small house, a little small four-room house, nothing fancy, I mean, just he, he said, you just would not believe it, it, it was nothing fancy there. Uh, had a little small car, and didn't buy new cars or anything like that. Just lived very sensible in life. Well, need to say that wasn't long after that that this dear lady passed away, and uh, a couple of months had gone by, two or three months had gone by, and he said he got a phone call from the lawyer's office one day, and said they were settling this lady's account, and for they needed for him to come by. Uh, the lawyer's office and sign uh, because she had left uh, basically her monies uh, to the church and she, she needed they needed him to come out and sign her estate and get all this settled and uh, he said okay I'll I'll be by and, and uh, I'll get it signed so he went by within a couple of days and met with him and and said uh, sitting at the lawyer's desk and said met with him and said I need you to sign this, that, and the other. And he reached over there, and he, he said, well, you know, what am I signing? And he said, he's signing the settlers' estate. And uh, he said, okay. He said, so what is this? Are we going to owe anything? The, the pastor was asking, are we going to owe anything, you know, to help her out or anything? And he said, no. He said, uh, we, just, we just need to get you this check here. So it's at, uh, it's uh, $750,000, and uh, we need to get you all this check. Uh, but you need to sign for it and settle the estate. And... Uh, but all those years, she had just lived comfortable, lived within her means, you know, put a little bit aside here and there, lived by herself, a little small house. Never, and she never made that lift life very big, Mark. Uh, she, she made that, that gross life was, was very big, and she gave it all away at the end. She gave it all away um, uh, to the church. And, of course, you know, I, I know the pastor, and I know the church, and I know this man that told me that very well. And uh, I definitely believe the story. That's, that's for sure, because he gave me names and and dates and things like that, but uh, you know, God just blessed her down through the years, and and at the end, she just gave it all to the Lord anyway. You know, she wasn't hoarding it for herself to try to uh, do some big thing. So, boy, God's good, ain't it? Amen. So, y'all keep throwing those little things back in the bank here and there, and keep continuing to throw them back. And you know, the Lord decide to make sure you got it signed off to the right thing before you go out. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. Y'all think I'm up here begging for that? I'm not. I'm just kidding. But Mark, I appreciate you. Thank you for all you've done. I uh, appreciate your hard work into that, and uh, y'all pray for us, and uh, we'll pick back up uh, next Wednesday night, and uh, so pray much about uh, that. And continue. I hope you've learned something from it. 
and I hope you'll be able to grow from it, uh, not only financially but spiritually. Uh, help you help you grow in your home. It'll it'll help your home. It'll help your uh, situation with the Lord down the road. Let, let me th- let me throw this out there. This may not mean anything to you, uh, but I just can I can I just tell you uh, how God will bless over the years. And, and I probably will not say this. I, James James will shoot me for even saying this because I never Jane and I we stay personal about our finances and everything else. But I can I can say this with honesty behind the pulpit tonight behind the pulpit. That since I've been saved, 35 years, that since I've been saved, I can honestly stand behind the pulpit and say this, and my wife has written all the checks for it. I've never written a check for it. But we have never missed, in 35 years, we have never missed paying our tithe. Never in 35 years. And uh, I don't say that braggingly tonight. I'm just saying God allowed us to. God allowed us to. And God has blessed us. People say, well, you do that because, you know, you've worked hard and you're able to pay it. No, I'm able to work hard and do those things because God blessed me with the, with the uh, strength and the ability and the, and the knowledge and the wisdom. And uh, God blessed me with all those things to be able to go and do all of these things that we've done over the years so that we could. But in 35 years, we never, never, never missed a tithe to our church. Now, I, now I credit that a lot to my wife because she writes the checks. Amen. Uh, but she don't have to come to me and ask, Daddy, are we going to pay tithes this week? Since, since we first started ever paying tithes from, my, from the time I got saved, she's never had to come and say, do you want me to go ahead and write tithes this week? It's been automatic in our life for, ever since then for 35 years. And God's taken care of us, amen? And God's met every need we've ever had. And the, he's gone over and above and abundant in our life because of it. It's just something to consider. I'm not bragging. If I had to brag on anybody, I'd brag on God. Amen, because it wouldn't have been me. Listen, before I got saved, I wouldn't pay tithes. My wife you asked, used to ask me to give money to the church, and I told her I didn't owe them anything. She worked, I was, and I'm serious. I, you can ask her. I said, you can give, your, give some of yours if you want to, but I'm not going to the church over there. I don't feel like I owe them anything. I got things I want to do, girl. Amen. I'm serious as I can be. But when I got saved, I never had a problem with it after that. It became automatic in our life. Amen. And I appreciate Jane and me and her being able to do that together in life. Let's all stand up.